Welcome to the Mr. Beacon podcast. This week is a very special episode. We're in Israel and we've been skirting around the topic of Williot for the last year and a half. And this week we're going to get right into it. I'm going to answer some frequently asked questions about what this company is doing in a really interesting area, energy harvesting, battery free Bluetooth. The way we're going to do this is uh, I'm going to interview myself for like two minutes. And then I'm going to turn the camera on some of my colleagues here at Williot and we're going to uh, hopefully answer some questions that are on the minds of people who care about how the Internet of Things is really going to scale. So our first question is, who is Williot? What does Williot do? Williot is a semiconductor company developing the world's first battery-free Bluetooth sticker. We developed the chip that enables this technology uh, and we provide a cloud virtual tag interface that makes it secure and easy to program. Now this has some really profound implications across the lifetime of products and it's going to change how things are made. We'll be able to track them as work in progress through factories, how they're distributed, tracking products in vans and trucks and distribution centers products will be able to help to sell themselves by communicating directly with consumers, uh, verifying authenticity, uh, and making new kinds of checkout experiences possible. And then most importantly, add value to the products themselves when they're owned. If they're lost, if they're stolen, they'll be easy to be found. And then lastly, in the recycling phase, then products will be easier to recycle because we'll know what's in them. So that's my answer to the first question. Now we're going to turn the question on the camera on to some friends and colleagues and ask them some questions. What is the one secret to making a battery-free Bluetooth radio the size of a sticker? Okay, so it's not just a Bluetooth radio. The device harvest, compute, sense and transmit and it's a way more than one thing it requires a system thinking of how to harvest energy in a really low sensitivity how to do really low energy consumption device how to change the software model to fit with all that and how to transmit that so uh, that's fully system change uh, in the implementation what is nanowatt computing and how does it work Nanovat computing, first it starts with uh, really uh, dealing with nanovat uh, power consumption, which means that the, the SOC must consume in the order of nanovats of a, a leakage, which is, uh, I would say, exceptional in terms of a current day technology. It's like in orders of a magnitude, probably, than what you'd find uh, usually in the market now for SOCs. So once you have this nanovat consuming a processor or SOC in a, during a, a power idle mode, then you need to store your uh, energy. So that's where you, you, you need to have your storage uh, capacitor. And you need to have this power management unit that uh, always monitors the amount of energy on the capacitor and then it can schedule jobs. Uh, it can be uh, processing jobs on the computer or the, on the CPU. It can be actual uh, uh, jobs uh, de do dealing with the radio of the chip, like a BLE transmission. So it always monitors the state of the energy on the capacitor and it schedules the job just when the, uh, uh, there's enough energy harvested on, uh, in the storage. And uh, in between operations, uh, the system just waits for uh, energy to, to accumulate. All this time consuming no more than nanowatts of uh, 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 energy. Uh, so it's like uh, uh, computing in waves. Whenever you have the energy, you do something, you halt, 
you harvest for some more, then you do uh, another operation, on and on. And uh, so that's uh, pretty much not about computing. How does what Williot is doing relate to the RFID industry and the Bluetooth industry? So what we are doing there essentially is we, we, we take parts from all of that ecosystems and build something new uh, with that. So from, from Bluetooth side, for instance, what we, what, we, what we have there is a huge infrastructure, existing devices, and we just use them by uh, choosing the, the communication protocol that, we, that our chip speaks uh, as Bluetooth. So we can connect to light bulbs which are Bluetooth enabled or anything, mobile phones of course. Yeah? So we, the direct access to end users is, is really uh, obvious and it's very simple. And that's what's lacking in the RFID world, that it's very easy to, to uh, speak to all kinds of devices in infrastructure, uh, at let's say logistics processes and simultaneously with end consumer devices. Um, but from the RFID world, what we inherit there is the production, the way of producing things. So we, uh, we are looking, targeting for low cost devices and the RFID is brilliantly set up there and they, they offer huge volumes for a reasonable price for all the kind of use cases and that's what we take as a big advantage. So combining these two setups there to create uh, great new products. So is Williot competing with the RFID industry? No, not at all. So the, the good part of it is that, that just because of that setup, we all need them as partners. So we are building up an ecosystem of partners, of friends, uh, helping us to be successful together. What kind of energy does the Williot chip harvest? Well, Williot's device uh, generates its own uh, power supply from the already available radio frequency energy in its ambient. Uh, this energy is available because uh, we have several standards that are heavily deployed around us, such as Wi-Fi, Bluetooth and cellular. Those uh, standards uh, require uh, mechanisms of uh, radio frequency devices which uh, repeatedly emit uh, electromagnetic uh, energy that uh, we can just uh, utilize for our own power supply. Uh, for comparison, uh, solar energy based on uh, indoor lighting uh, has four times, four times of order of magnitude higher power available per area comparing to uh, RF ambient energy. What kind of processor does the Williot MCU have and why is it useful? So it's, it's a good question. In, in our tiny silicon actually we have two processors. One is uh, Cortex M0 Plus which is kind of the, the de facto standard for IoT solution. You will find it in any IoT device available, name it, you'll find it uh, there. It gives us the flexibility to do whatever we want in terms of uh, security, uh, sensing, uh, integrating with the, with the uh, external libraries. It gives us full flexibility that we need uh, as a company. And we also have a tiny uh, MCU which gives us the flexibility to work in extreme low power for very unique uh, uh, activities or action that we need fast and get done with it. Why does a chip company need a cloud? Eventually, our semi, our devices create data and the data is in the physical world, it interacts with people, and we need to preserve the privacy. So everything we make, everything we send is encrypted, and the cloud is our means to uh, uh, make sure that privacy is not compromised. So since our sensors and tags are uh, uh, low priced, uh, we need to make sure that the data is still high quality. So we use sophisticated algorithms in the cloud in order to make the telemetry good enough for our customers to use. What kinds of companies is Williot dealing with in the field? All kinds of companies in the smart packaging, inventory management, smart things, and the technologies that want to have their things connected to, to the internet. It's basically, it's uh, smart clothing and uh, different kinds of uh, uh, re retailers that uh, manage the store management and uh, the storage management. 
as well as uh, uh, sensor, different kind of sensors, measurement, uh, temperature sensors, measurement, and stuff like this. What is the one song you would take on a trip to Mars? Okay, that's that stuff. I would choose uh, Scorpions, uh, Wind of Change. I like changes. <laughs> <laughs> Life on Mars, David Bowie, would be on my short list. But it's not the song I would take. Um, maybe Major Tom, but it's uh, bad karma for a space travel, so... <laughs> I'd go with uh, Why is the Wind, uh, David Boy, uh, all the way. Well, it's like uh, um, it has this story. It's like a full odyssey of a song. Like it's, uh, it feels like something that uh, it's a good story. So quite recently, I, I uh, visited a musical together with my seven-year-old daughter. That was Mary Poppins. And she was so super excited about it, and I, I loved her reactions. And I think to keep me reminded of that very so special moment, I would choose one of that songs. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure which one, but I think I love that. That will be Comfortably Numb by Pink Floyd. And why? Well, I never get tired of it. Uh, it uh, has a dramatic opening, dramatic ending, and it happens at a dramatic point in uh, Ellen Parker's movie. Yes, the one song I would take is uh, Space Oddity by David Bowie. It's, it's, they are talking about Mars and David Bowie is my favorite artist. Uh, it probably would be a kind of magic Queen song. Any reason why? I think it's because of the wonder from the universe in a, in a child's eye. Show must be, go on by Queen because of uh, different difficulties that we have, but we will overcome it all. I think this will be the song.